Here we go. Welcome to the Plastic EP and Robin Show. How are you, Robin? I'm doing well. How are you? Looking good, yeah. Plastic. Yeah, and you're looking groovy. How was your week? Uh, week was pretty good, you know. Okay, you're, you're I've got a special good. guest. Now, don't worry about Austin Powers. This guy lived the life of the swing in six, 60s. It's our friend, Leslie Cavendish. Here he is. Welcome, to Leslie. Hi, Leslie. Welcome. Thank you. Thank it's you. Good to talk to you. So happy to have you. I'm very happy to be here. I haven't seen plastic at least for two hours. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Leslie's Leslie's coming in from swinging London. Hasn't been swinging since the sixties. But let me tell you, that must have been a groovy time. The swinging sixties, Leslie. It was a time, but uh, you didn't realise it was swinging. It was only until later in history that you said it, you think it was swinging, but uh, it was a normal time. It was a time for uh, a time to. The only good thing about it was you watched change happen, and that was the yep. great thing. You know. I've got to ask you. You used to work for the big salon there in London. What was the name of the salon again before you went to Apple? Vidal Sassoon. Thank you for mentioning that. Now I want to ask you about Robin Z. Because this is pre-pandemic or pandemic at the moment. If it was the swing of the 60s. Yes. And you I had a cut. Robin's here. I'm going to say this first, Leslie. I'm a little bit embarrassed because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And I haven't been to a hair salon since February. So I have cut my own hair. So I, I, I know I've made mistakes. I have mistakes. Well, actually, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, how have you got your hair? Your, your hair must have been uh, since February, so what are we talking about? So your hair was like a bob length, yeah? Maybe chin length, you let it grow? That's what I should do. I should have chin like this? Well, yeah, that's a nice start, you know, but it doesn't look too bad anyway. You just called the, the layer look. Um, so I should get rid of the length. I'm, I'm 52 years old, so maybe it's time for the length to go. What age do you think length on women? It's not a matter of length, you know, women like length, but um, uh, the, um, the hair, you should, should, you, should, you should cut the hair to suit the face. Now, may I say, I don't bet you for a while, you've got a nice face, so why, you know, you can let your hair a bit shorter. It's nice, you know, do you feel comfortable with it? Do you like it long? You I do, I've long. had it long for a long time. I only had short hair once. I've never had the look, and I, I always point the wrong way. That plastic is sporting right now, but I'm sure you recognize plastic's haircut. I love it. You know, I've told him, I've nurtured him through this whole process from no hair to this hair, and I've, we finally get into the Vidal Sassoon one sided cut. It's looking very chic. Um, the ears, as you can see, it's growing nicely, and the, the color is natural, which is one of the nicest things about plastic hair. It's great. I think I look like Fred Flintstone, actually. But I'm going to ask you, which Beatle do I look like in 1964? Which one do you reckon I'm closest the to my head? The Yellow Submarine Beatle. Yeah. You look like you've been underwater. Which I Beatle do I look like? I the head. You've got all four. It's so difficult to, to sort of distinguish. John, George, Paul, or Ringo, EP. I don't know. Do I look more like Ringo? You look like Ringo? Yeah, you can look like Ringo. Hair look like Ringo. Turn to the side a bit. Oh, that's Paul. Now, the other side. Is, yeah, now, Mr. Nobody. George, yeah, yeah, George. Uh, put your hair forward. There's a bit of jump. Yeah, there you go. Look at it. Just shake your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how did you come up with the Beatles signature style? Because you actually, I mean, if I think about it, you really defined an era with that haircut. The haircut. Unfortunately, uh, yeah. Actually, it wasn't me that came up with that haircut. It's, um, it was Astrid Kirscher that was going out um, with Stu Sutcliffe um, in Hamburg. You know, she she was a photographer and she was bothered with. And 
she had she was very sort of advanced in her ways regarding you know being a photographer and when the guys went to paris they used to have you know rocker's hair you know greased back hair and leather they got the part which was great especially um uh pete best pete best had fantastic hair but his hair was curly um could be another good reason why he was dropped from the beatles um there, there are the rumors but he certainly couldn't have had the hair like plastic you know so um he missed out on that one but yeah she sort of did that hair took away the the sort of grease and combed the hair forward and um yeah it was really more for her and then they just sort of made sure they always looked shiny brian Exty was the one that sort of uh, put the polish to everything basically made sure that the right shoes the right um, mm. suits the hair was clean and he was immaculate anyway if you look at any picture of brian Exty, he was married. Leslie, can i ask you yeah what year did you cut one of the Beatles here? Who was the first Beatle you cut his hair and what year was it? So the first time I cut was Paul McCartney in uh, in September 66. It was it was three weeks after the final, uh, two weeks after the final concert uh, in Candlestick Park. So I literally, he had sort of hung up his uh, guitar and I did his tie and um, he was at home literally two weeks after that show. So that's the first time I cut it. And I cut it at his house. There was a big difference than coming into the salon or going to his house. So that was the first one. So I have, I have a question for you. So, you you know, when you cut hair, hair falls on the ground. Yeah. Did, did you ever save any of it? No, never. Now, I knew that um, that was what people would want me to do or... If I was greedy, um, I could have um, taken lots of hair. I got, I got offered lots of money for um, uh, a Beatle impresario in America, a parasite, basically. The, when the Beatles were toured America, they used to go in the swimming pool and used to stay in the hotel. So the guy, uh, in his wisdom, cut up the sheets in squares and sold sheep. He bottled the water and beetle water. He offered me, actually, at the time, the equivalent of $100,000 if I could give him beetle hair in 67. I actually, it sounds terrible, I sound like a goody goody, but I actually put the phone down on him. And uh, I didn't want to do that. You know, when you get an opportunity, you know, you become a beetle fan, you end up cutting, you know, I went to see them very first times in 63 by fluke. Uh, and uh, four years later, five years later, I'm cutting their hair. And, you know, I've never believed it. So, you know, why? Yeah, you know, now you look at it and think, should I, shouldn't I? But no, I didn't want to. And also as well, you become a part of, you get trusted. You know, you know, I could have, you become part of that inner circle. So, yeah, why not? I enjoyed it. And uh, it was nice. It, it was nice to get the trust of, uh, of the Beatles and their entourage. So, Once you get their trust, you're in the inner circle, they trust you. You can't do that. They won't put up with people that go against the inner circle. This man was on the Magical Mystery Tour bus and in the movie and at the front of the fish shop with the Beatles alongside him, sitting on the dining table with Paul McCartney. This man is a legend. And i just got to say, Robin, just watch this. This is his book, The Cutting Head by Leslie Carendish, and I want everyone to go out and buy it because the story's inside it. Unbelievable, but also you got a Spanish version too, haven't you, Leslie? I have indeed got a Spanish version. I am and how do they get the books now? Tell us where the books are. Well, they get the books through, uh, you know, our good friend David Bedford. We've got the yes. Beatle Story um, um, book, Beatle Story book, or basically come with, uh, get to me on Messenger, Facebook, or go to www.beatleshairdresser.com and I'm going to be too happy to. Um, Sign it, send it, ask me questions. I don't mind. I've been doing a lot of Q and A's lately from people. Um, yeah, I'm there. I noticed on your website, I was looking at it earlier, that you do tours also. I do. Well, yeah, I was, um, but I, I, I don't sort of do it the whole time. It's, there's certain tours that you can go anywhere in the world. You know, you come to London, and you can go on a Beatle tour. There's plenty of really good guides out there. These guides will give you the complete history, the date, how many people turned up at a gig, um, you know, when they did this, that. 
I'm not like that. You know, you want to come on a tour with me, and I wouldn't do any more than five. Um, I'll take you on a personal tour. I'll tell you certain stories. So, for instance, you go on a Beatle tour here, and you'll go to, let's say, um, Savile Row. You're going to the Apple headquarters buildings. So everyone goes there because they know there, there was the rooftop concert, and they'll stand outside, and they'll point up at the ceiling, and they go, there, the Beatles did the gig there, and whatever. Come with me, and I'll tell you what it was like inside, because I was inside that building on that day. So I'll give a personal view, and um, I don't want to sort of be like um, a, a tape, you know, uh, you know, every minute. So I don't do that often, but if they do, they can contact me, and, um, yeah, we go around in a nice... Uh, exclusive VIP car uh, with a chauffeur and um, it's a luxury tour with um, luxury stories that go with it. So, yeah. Contact so we go me. from the magical mystery tour to the luxury tour that. now and also I've got to say, do you take them to the spot where the magical mystery tour bus pulled up and you're waiting outside with Paul and everybody to get in the bus? Do you show them the spot? I do. That's also a place opposite Madame Tussauds in London. Um, a really funny thing happened, and I, I, this was happened to me last week. Um, there's a picture of me uh, in the newspaper talking in a canteen uh, with McCartney and myself. So the reason what happened, I got to this place, also a place, at about half past eight in the morning. Uh, it, was, it, it was a cold day, and the first thing I saw was um, McCartney sitting on a pavement leaning against the rails talking to um, one of the other guys uh, in, in, in the film who I didn't even know what he was going to do in the film but he was there and people were walking by you know early morning office people and you know you wouldn't expect to see a beetle sitting on the floor in 1967 you, you'd walk by and think is that really him is it really him and then they would stop and then they would go oh it is him and he was very polite he did a few autographs but Mostly people didn't believe that that was actually happening, you know. Um, we were waiting for the bus, and the bus doesn't turn up. So he sort of disappears for a bit. But as he stood up, we are waiting, and he just said to me, uh, do you want a cup of tea? Because opposite there is uh, London Transport, you know, the underground train drivers uh, cafe, which they've been on the trains in the more early morning shift, and they're there for their breakfast. And we walked in there, into the cafe. Can you imagine seeing these guys who come back from an early morning shift and McCartney walks in. And this is a really high, this is 67, you know. And uh, we sat there and there's a lovely picture of me and McCartney uh, and the waitress giving us a cup of tea. So, um, yeah, it was quite an interesting first day. Sounds now, I've got like to ask you about when you were cutting hair, was it Britt Eklund that came in with her brother? Who was it? Came with a lovely brother, Carl. Carl, Carl lovely Carl. His name was Carl, um, and uh, yeah, she came in. Uh, I was at Vidal's at the time. A guy who had fantastic hair, just like yours, um, plastic, but he had you know Swedish blonde hair, uh, really thick. And she actually said to me, um, "Can you cut my uh, brother's hair, Beatles style?" So I've got a picture somewhere. I think you've seen it. I've me, seen it. Me and so soon as uh, so in the mirror, cutting in, you know, fun doing his hair there and everything. She's standing next to me there. Yeah, you get a lot of people, you know, it, it was, it's like, um, you know, if Robin came in, she wanted to have her hair done, you would look at someone like uh, Mary Quant, or you look at someone like Nancy Quant, you know, these actresses that had these fantastic hair that Vanell shaped into this, um, you know, into this perfect cut. So everyone was sort of copying everyone else. Then you had Twiggy, then you people wanted their hair looking like Twiggy, right. you know. But then you asked before, Robin, you know, how... Should one have their hair? When I say you have to feel comfortable, but there's lots, we had lots of women that come into the shop, uh, into the salon, should say shop, uh, into the salon there, and they would want, let's say, a Mary, uh, a Mary Quant, and they would have a face three times as big as, you know, and you just can't do it. So you have to improvise and you have to be uh, discreet and say why they can't have it. But, you know. Do you still cut hair, Leslie? Yeah, I've, I've been known to cut a few hair. I've cut a few of my friends' hair. I've uh, I've cut a few hair for TV interviews while the um, interviewer is uh, is uh, interviewing me. We did that in Chicago. And we did that in New York last year uh, for, for Sky TV. A uh, documentary is making, and he suggested, "Could I cut his hair so he's he can interview me from the mirror?" 
and I was cutting his head. Yeah, I loved it. Still like it. Did you get a lot of Beatles haircut requests over the years to copy? I would imagine. I did. I tell you, yeah, I did. I, I used to do this. Part of my luxury tour was the finale was I would cut your hair, and um, everything was. I mean, I, I got a friend of mine who's got a salon. Uh, in St. John's Wood, a nice part of London, in fact, around the corner from where Paul McCartney lives, and, and he actually does uh, Nancy, Paul's hair, uh, wife's hair. And uh, I used to use his salon, so I used to go on the tour, and then we'd go to the salon, and then we would talk, and I'd cut their hair. I got a request from somebody, from this lady, saying it was her uh, husband's uh, 60th birthday. So I went round to their house, and we uh, we were talking. He just wanted to have his hair cut. He didn't want the tour. He wanted me to tell stories. And first thing I do when I see people, I look at their hair and I wear it up. I think, you know, if I had to do it, how would I do it? And this guy had the most magnificent head of hair. It was so thick. It was down to his shoulders. And I'm saying to myself, okay, I can tell him these stories, and I reckon. I could probably cut his hair in about 15 minutes because he would only want the ends trimmed and I could just cut the ends, whatever. And after about 45 minutes, I said to him, right, um, I think it's now time to cut your hair. And he went, okay, and he sat down and I'm, I'm really relaxed and cool. And he's got the mirror there. And I said to him, um, which was a mistake, uh, how would you like your hair? And he had his hair literally, I told him, really down here. He said, I want it like John Leonard's and Sergeant Pepper. And I, I suddenly got a sweat come over me. I thought, oh, my God, I, you know, I know that haircut. And that's not a quick trim. That's a serious, concentrate haircut. And I did it without a mirror. And his wife kept knocking on the door and said, are you ready, darling? Are you ready? And I was going, no, no, he's not ready yet. I'll tell you when he's ready. And I'm really sweating, you know. And this was a serious haircut, from long to short. Finally, um, after about 40 minutes there, and I, you know, I couldn't really talk to him because I, I think you know, I shouldn't have got involved in this. This is, this is all too much. And she came in, and I thought, what's she going to say? If she says the wrong thing, I, that's it. And she opened the door, and I said, he said, ready, darling? And he opened the door, and he looked around, and she went, you look like John Lennon. <laughs> oh, great, let's get out of here. <laughs> yeah, so I, haven't, I, I stopped doing haircuts on tours because I don't want to go through that policy. I can understand that. I can definitely. I know, and, and I, I really appreciate, I have to say, you know, I was kind of kidding about the, the hair. I knew, you know, you are a trustworthy guy. And, it, you know, so I'm, I'm curious if there's a story that you might be willing to share, obviously, you know, keeping the trust and faith, but like a fun little story of something that happened in the salon or in a house that... that oh, I, I can tell you a funny story that happened in the salon um, when I was a 16, 15-year-old uh, junior, uh, fresh from school, and we had a lady, uh, she was the Marilyn Monroe of uh, English... Uh, uh, filmed with a lady, lovely lady called Diana Dawes. Mm -hmm. She had an hourglass figure, uh, bleached blonde hair, and uh, she, she always had a naughty smile, always said something naughty. And I was the assistant to the guy that, who used to do her hair. And she used to tease me a lot, you know, give me that little look there. And they, she used to have wild parties down in the countryside. You used to read about it in the newspapers. Uh, her husband at the time was a bit of a uh, a bit of a uh, a nice a, a, a guy that you had to watch, but he was a nice guy. Um, and she said to me, "We used to wash her hair," and she used to hear all about these parties. And I used to say, "Oh, can I come?" And she said, "Leslie, I'll tell you when you're ready." And I said, "Great." So okay. And every time I'd wash her hair, I used to say to her for a joke, "Am I ready?" <laughs> she used to say, I'll tell you when you're ready. She said, I'm coming in next week with somebody that you may like. And I went, okay, fine. And then we were in the basement of a really beautiful chic salon in the Grover House, just off Park Lane at Sassoon's. And the next thing I could see, uh, Diana Dawes walk down the stairs. 
And before I could see this face, I saw this body walk in, and it was Jane Mansfield. She brought Jane Mansfield down to have a hair done. And, you know, every guy, she can't help but she walked in like she was on a catwalk with the tightest, you know, hourglass figure, a good thing, a blonde hair. She looked like Jane Mansfield. And she sat down and the stylist said, right, Mr. Mansfield, I think you need um, your hair bleached. Uh, would you like to go, uh, blonde, would you like to go upstairs? So he said, yeah. So he said, Leslie, would you take Miss Dawes and Miss Mansfield upstairs in the lift to the changing room? And we, I had to, and I went so red because when I, we have a lift, we had a lift there, which was the tiniest lift in the world. And I stood in the middle of uh, Jane Mansfield and Donna Dawes, wow. and they were giggling at me, and they were laughing at me. <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, I could go deaf. This is absolutely amazing. It was just a funny story. Um, that was a nice little thing that happened at the dance, innocently. What's your, what's your favorite um, Beatles moment? A little moment that you shared cutting hair. Oh, the, on the hair was um, was actually cutting McCartney's hair in the very early days, and his girlfriend who got me the uh, who, who asked if I would do it, Jane Asher. Uh, she was filming down in Bristol, sort of western uh, of England, and when I went round to Paul's house, we went upstairs to his bathroom to cut his hair. Uh, not at the salon. I used to put water in the sort of in a cup and pour it over his head. So you know, this is so Paul McCartney. You could afford anything there, and he was just so natural. It really was. Uh, he put me at ease at least, and uh, he wasn't playing the big star. And I did his hair that time. The second time I went down there, I said to him, "Oh, I haven't seen Jane for a while. She's been in the salon." So no, she's filming. Now don't forget, Paul had just uh, stopped the final concert. Uh, was what maybe a month away, a, a month finished, and I said, oh, "Are you going to go and um, are you, you going to go and visit her at the, at the film set?" And he said, "No, I can't do that because when I go down there, they take it away from the film, and it's always about Paul, me, the Beatles. So no, I'm not going." And I just said, "That's a shame." And I said, "When she finishes, will you go on holiday with her?" I suppose. He said, "No, I've got the same problem." So okay, I'm doing his hair in the mirror, and I just said to him. Um, what a shame. I said, uh, why don't you go in disguise? Mm. I just said, disguise, I don't know if I've been put a moustache, do this, do that. And at the time, he was unshaven and had a little part of, he was unshaven in about four day growth. And he said, he just looked at me in the mirror and just said, what do you mean? I didn't actually know what I meant, actually. And I said, uh, why don't I cut all your hair off? Oh, wow. And he looked at me and he said, Go on then, do it. So I said, yes. So I cut Paul McCartney's hair about half inch all over. I literally, you talk about taking hair, I could have made a fortune with the hair that fell on the floor. <laughs> and I'm actually kicking it away. You know, there's a lot of beetle hair on the floor. And I thought to myself, when it was all over, he didn't sort of go, oh my God, what have you done? Um, he just went, okay, that's great, thanks. Went downstairs with him, and I thought to myself, when I left, what would happen if Brian Epstein gets an offer of so much money that they said to the people, look, we do one more gig, okay? They want us in, let's say, New York next week, and he's got a short haircut who sees his hair, right? That was my little jokey thinking. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, um, next thing, I, next thing I, I, I saw, five weeks later, Paul McCartney coming back, it was in a great big picture in the newspaper, McCartney coming back from uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, with Jane Asher and Mount Evans, been on a safari holiday, and he got through there disguised. So that was a nice little story that uh, ended up uh, um, ended up really good. What, you know, to say to a Beatles, I've got newspaper cousin that says, uh, uh, Beatle hairdresser, uh, it says, Leslie Cavendish, the man that made poor the skinhead. <laughs> <laughs> So now, I've got a text here from Charles Rosen. Now, he said, did Diana tease you or your hair? Uh, she could have. Uh, Charles would know better than me, but uh, <laughs> uh, she certainly teased me. I got a double tease. <laughs> Can you believe Jane Mansfield came in? That's unbelievable. 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 But she did. 
Now, I've got to ask you, when you were in Paul's house, you told me another time, he had the Sergeant Pepper outfit in his room, and then you were talking about a famous painting. We won't even go there. But what I'm trying to say is, living there in Cavendish Avenue, right, and I know I've seen photos of his of his backyard. He's got a very long backyard for London, hasn't he? Yes. Yeah. It's right next to Lord's. We have a famous cricket ground there, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Sergeant Pepper uniform was the premiere of the uh, the party of the Magical Mystery Tour at the Royal Langster Hotel in London. Um, I didn't know when I went around to do their hair that it was fancy dress. And he said to me, what are you going at tonight? And, you know, they, they dressed up as Purdy, Queen and King, you know, with pearls. With, that's what, in East London, the Cockneys would dress up uh, and, and parade. It was a yearly parade. And I said, oh, I'm, I, I'm not really going in uh, um, fancy dress. He said, well, it's fancy dress. <laughs> he actually said to me, go upstairs and see if there's anything there that, that, that you like. Oh, really? Okay. So I went upstairs and there I was in the, I opened his wardrobe and there was the Sergeant Pepper uniform. The blue one. The blue one. And wow. I, took off, I took it off the hanger and I put it on. <laughs> and I said to myself, you can't go there up to the matter with you in that Sergeant Pepper uniform. But you know what? I know I put it on. And I put it back in the wardrobe, came downstairs, and now I saw something. And I went in a, in a beautiful uh, crushed velvet mauve velvet suit that we had from uh, Apple Taylor, which Jimi Hendrix, all his jackets and everything with velvet. So, yeah, that was an interesting little uh, open summer's wardrobe. We've got the original Sergeant Pepper. How did it fit? Did it fit you well? The epaulets were a bit tight. <laughs> <laughs> it just looked, you know, this is Sergeant Pepper there. Just, just, your head, my head was just going, you know, I was a Beatles fan, you know, and I'm, I could, I'm keeping all this in my head. Um, and yeah, these were nice little things there, you know, like if I would have touched, uh, sold his hair, it would have, I wouldn't have had a chance, would I, you know, to do these things. Did you, um, so you toured with them as well? Did you do their hair before? No, that was before me. The touring... Uh, no, because they were going from city to city, studio to studio. You would have, uh, you would have um, um, at the TV studios, you would have the artist, the makeup artist, the hairdresser. So, yeah, there were loads of people that could turn around and say, I did the Beatles hair. Yeah, there were loads of people. But when they retired from, from touring, yeah. um, I was cutting Paul's hair a lot. I say a lot, uh, as much as he wanted to. And then... With that, you had the other Beatles all sort of um, came in, you know, from uh, George to Paul. Ringo, not so much, because his wife, Barbara, uh, was a hairdresser, a nice lady as well. So, um, yeah. yeah. Which was your favorite to cut? What haircut did you like to do the best? I really like cutting George's hair, because I used to do it, I used to dry hair, um, with uh, with my fingers, I still do. I don't use a brush. I think it's you get more of a natural look. And George has always got this long hair. We used to come in. We had a salon. They opened up a salon for me uh, in the King's Road in Chelsea, uh, which was great. So because um, Paul lived in town, and when there was in meetings at, in Savile Road, Paul used to you know it only took him about fifteen minutes to come in, but. John and Paul, uh, John, George and uh, Ringo lived down in the countryside, so they used to come up and used to have his uh, chauffeur um, drop him outside the salon. He would come downstairs to the basement. He'd come in, have his hair washed, dried, and we used to sit there and we used to have a little chat. It was always about music, and he was telling me that uh, he's learning this instrument, the Indian instrument called a sitar, and I didn't even know what he was talking about, a sitar. <laughs> And uh, I said, oh, okay. And, um, you know, just things like that. It's only when you look back later that, you know, obviously he's with Ravi Shankar and then, you know, he's, he, you know, his head is into so many other things, you know, um, uh, lyric wise, you know, writing songs, which he didn't really have enough chance to uh, put down a Beatle album. So, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, he was a great peaceful guy as well. There. Leslie, I've got to ask you, you cut George's hair at Abbey Road. While he was recording the song, uh, something. That's right. 
I don't know if it was something, but I, I, it's, okay. there's a very strange. Uh, I, I have a picture. I have a few photos of me cutting George Harrison's hair. I was sure that I, it, that the picture was taken either at a photo shoot or at the salon. Years later, um, a guy called Tony Bramwell, who um, uh, works for the Beatles, uh, told me that he took the photograph at uh, EMI, which was actually before I heard. And I'm trying to work out that it shows you. I must have obviously go when I watched the Beatles in court. I always had my comb and scissors with me. I always had my hairdressing equipment with me because um, very rarely I would be asked, but I was on call if somebody wanted to, I don't know. But you never think while someone's recording, they'll decide to go and have their hair cut, would you? I would have thought so anyway. But somewhere along the line, George has either got fed up recording, fed up downstairs, or whatever it is, or just said to himself, I need to get away, and he asked me to cut his hair. And I remember, you know, there was a little space out there now, but I recall about it. Um, yeah, I cut his hair then. Tony Brown, I took the photos there. So, yeah, that was a very strange thing having a haircut in a recording session. I think it was actually doing Sergeant Pepper, um, Mr. Plastic. Unbelievable. These stories are unbelievable. And, you know, with the Magical Mystery Tour, Robin, let me tell you, while he's on the tour, they were told to not drive down country little roads, right? So, so they drove down a little country road to a bridge and the bus got stuck on the bridge and it held up traffic both ways for what? Three hours was it, Leslie? Yeah, they're supposed to be going to uh, Whittacombe Fair. And uh, I'm telling you, the whole journey was a magical journey because I'm not sure everyone knew what they were doing. You know, it was a sort of, um, you know, you knew you were going from London down to Cornwall, you know, the south of England. Um, and on the way, they were stopping off uh, and they were improvising. You would have thought that this bridge, and we're being followed by lots of press, you would have thought that someone would have thought, can we get the coach over this bridge to take us to the fair? And the driver is just driving, and next thing, he gets stuck on the bridge. He literally gets stuck. He can't go through. So he's had to reverse all the way back. Yeah, it's uh, crazy little things like that were happening. And you're being filmed at the same time, you know. And that film, I'm not sure uh, that... I've seen photographs of it. I'm not sure I've actually seen live film, but I'm sure there is live film because there's films that coming up from that magical mystery tour that... I mean, there's the fish and chip shop, fish and chip shop scene. That was cut out of the original um, uh, movie. Uh, that I actually appear a lot in it, which is quite oh, nice. Yeah. I really like it. So, um, if it, you know, they got that footage, and I've seen other footage they haven't used. So, yeah, that was a funny time. Plus, no one thought about it. It's fun to think about. It's also interesting because people don't think of celebrities as real people. And the way that you're telling these stories really, you know, brings them to life as real people. They're real people who get their hair cut. They do things, yeah. eat fish and chips, even though that was part of the movie. But, you know, just like the rest of us. And I think that that's something that interviews like this help bring to light, you know, and that and you're a very lovely person. Um, I, tell, I tell you one of the big changes that's happened, why it was like that. Today, you know, let's just go to someone, let's go to U2, for instance, right? right? A big band, fabulous band. You would never get near them. They have an entourage that you couldn't even, you'd have to break down 500 walls to doors to get into them. Very the was, you know, at Apple, at Savo, uh, you know, the, the, the three Savo Row there, they had one security guard at the door. They had two receptionists. What? And you could just bluff your way in. You could go, you know, they, they, they didn't, they were sort of, um, I won't say they were open, you know, for everyone to see, but, you know, you could walk down the King's Road, for instance, where the shop was. I could see Mick Jagger walking by, you know, Brian Jones walking by. I mean, you see George Harrison walk by there. I'm not saying that people wouldn't stop them and recognise them. But you can do that today. There will be, there'll, there'll be bodyguards, you know. And unfortunately, you've only got to look at John Lennon, bless him, it's his birthday this week, um, to see how easy it was for someone to get near someone. Um, that couldn't happen today. 
Did you get up to that? When I know, like, I, I recently watched an interview with it was with Lady Gaga actually, and she said she physically gets ill if someone comes up to her and takes a picture. It just really stresses her out. Was that something that would upset them, or not really? Or what was the reaction to something like that? If a beforehand, no, I think the only thing they were worried about beforehand is whether they get their hair pulled out. You know? <laughs> or their clothes ripped. I mean, that was their biggest fear. Um, you know, screaming, screaming girls, just screaming at them, making them deaf probably, you know, but to be shot or to be injured, it's, I didn't, I, I don't think it, it never happened. You know, you'd get killed in a car crash. You know, that's how you got killed. You wouldn't get killed by a fan or a so-called fan. So, yeah, that, 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 uh, I think that changed the whole thing when people realised that uh, these people are very vulnerable. So I don't blame them today, but uh, at the time, plenty of, plenty of time to get near a beetle if you wanted to. It's too bad that it has to be that way. You know, yeah. It's yeah. a very sad thing. Yeah, it is. Well, they want to kill presidents, which they did. And they, you know, there are nutters out there that can do things, but um, there you go. Did yeah, you I just want to ask you, Leslie, if I can, with the Bee Gees, who are you closest to? Who are you a good friend with? My best mate was Vince Maloney. Um, uh, your, your, your Aussie mate, a lovely guy. He was uh, him and Colin Peterson, Patterson. He was the drummer. Vince was the lead guitarist. And the three brothers. And um, on the three Bee Gees, um, I probably met and, and had the sort of uh, used to go and walk my dog with uh, Barry Kibb, uh dog. Uh, he lived um, I lived he lived up in Eaton Square uh, in Belgravia and I lived the poor end of uh, Chelsea. So um, but I used to go around to his house and cut his hair and um, he used to play the guitar there for me. You know, I got my own little um, people, you know, request you know, private auditions. <laughs> Uh, little thing. I went there one day, I'll never forget, it was lovely, I used to go around there. Again, you never used to know who would be around these places. And Richie Havens was there. Uh, and uh, they started uh, playing Beatles songs there. Amazing. We sit in the corner, little groupy me. There I was. Did you meet Lulu? Lulu used to come into the salon, yeah, a lot, a lot. I never cut mm -hmm. her hair, but um, I used to wash her hair. You know, the stylist uh, at Bedell's used to go to different stylists, you, you know, every three months. Used to, you know, get used to different people, how they would cut and do hair. And uh, that's how you learn your post with this guy, Mark Hilliard. He used to do Dusty Springfield's hair and Lulu's hair. Um, yeah. Is it true that if you're a hairdresser, that everybody wants, you te wants to tell you their life? I believe that when they come there, it's like a therapy. They cut their hair, they've got no one to talk to. And they tell you everything. That's well, true, isn't it? Well, I won't, won't say it's, it's quite like that, but let's put it this way. Um, who's the closest thing? You know, when a woman comes in at half past eight in the morning, so what's she done? She's either, she's got out of bed, she said goodbye to her husband or her lover, and then she comes in and the hairdresser is touching her hair and she is making herself up to look the person that when she leaves with her hair and her makeup. So yeah, sometimes people open up to you, you know, and um, you, don't ask, you don't ask, you wait. That was the secret of Vanel said, always remember. That so you have to be a bit of a therapist as well, as apart from cutting hair. You know, well, yeah, I don't know about being a therapist. <laughs> I think you definitely have to, you have a very charming personality, so I'm sure people love oh, yes. haircuts. Yes. I'm sure they did. They always open up to good old lads. You know something, Robin? Can I say something? I tend to agree with him. You know your hair. Not that you have to listen to me, but I reckon your hair would look great just to your collar. What do you think? Yeah, it look lovely. It look lovely. Honestly, you've got, you got a good face. You've got and you're carrying face. less too. You've got to understand that too. You're carrying less on your head. <laughs> I did have it this length once, and maybe it well, is time. I don't know. Maybe, maybe yeah. I would need Leslie to do that when the travel bans are lifted. I'll have That's to go. Right. We'll do you that might go right. back to that haircut. I'll go to London, and I and I will not ask you for a John Lennon haircut. I promise. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, I what about a Ringo cut? 
I don't think that would bode too well for me. I actually had sent, I, I sent Plastic a photo altered of the two of us with Beatles haircuts. He said it wasn't a big look for us. So. I look like 120. <laughs> You do look all right there. You look all right. Tell me, what's happening down in, are you all right down there in Melbourne, Australia? Yeah, we're all right. The curfew stopped, but we still got things where we can't leave our house, go more than five kilometres and okay. all this. But let me tell you, when I get on these interviews, I just forget it. Forget it's it. like, you know, and I've got to tell you something. Someone sent me a very nice email or message from Liverpool and said, thank you so much for the interviews. You don't know how uplifting it is to watch your shows. And that, that's what makes it for me. Just someone yeah. to tell me, hey, you know, you know, I'm feeling really up and happy because I'm watching the interviews and I'm enjoying it. That's, you know, that to me is great. Well, that's, that's what you, you give, you know. You're the one that's doing it and you give. And um, you, you've got this way about you that makes everyone, someone feel like that. I mean, you, want to, you, can, you, can be, you can go on the aggressive mode if you want to, but that's, you know, you, you, you are plastic as you are. You can't now, I'm ask you, smile and look at famous coming to see you at Sidel. <laughs> at Sidel? <laughs> <laughs> we beat you. Hey, have you here. seen Bo Derek? Uh, no, no. Can I, I tell did. you a few beautiful women? Tell me if you've met them. Uh, yeah, you well, you know, you just have to go. Okay, through. but I'm going for the ones. I'm going for the ones that I don't What's think. About guys? What about the guys, plastic? Now yeah. wait a minute. You can ask him. You I can ask him about the guys. Robin, now, Robin, Robin by Derek, you met by Derek, didn't you? No, Robin. I tell you, a guy. Let's let's look at Robin. Let's let's make Robin happy. My mother, where everyone used to have the Beatles on their wall, my mother had Tony Curtis. <gasps> on the wall. I, get a, I get a phone call from his manager that says, Mr. Curtis is staying at the Dorchester Suite, the presidential suite at the Dorchester Hotel Park Lane. Mr. Curtis would like you to come up and cut his hair. And I said, sure. I put the phone down. I was more excited Wow. Knowing I've got to look at Tony Curtis's hair, more excited to go and tell my mum what I'm doing, and on top of it, Tony Curtis has got a, has got a haircut named after him. You know the, the you know the the um, DA, and um, do you know that what that is? So I'm not you, sure. Okay, so when you when you in especially we used to go to the barbers, uh, we used to say, "Can we have a DA, please?" And a DA is when you put the hair back. And you, it's got a crease down the bottom, and DA stands for duck sauce. Oh, okay. So, that is. so Tony, everyone had a Tony Curtis, and here's the man. I'm going to go and cut his hair. So I, I met him. He came over for um, the premiere of the Boston Strangler uh, film, and uh, he was amazing. He was an amazing guy. And I'm, you're talking about beautiful women. You know, if you get Tony Curtis who's still alive, and ask him what women. He, he, you, you run out of numbers, you know. I love that them. movie, Houdini. Houdini's a great movie. It, it, he was actually a very good actor, but look at the women. He not only went with and married, but who he, who he starred with. So, yeah. He, he was, um, that must be. You wouldn't like him, Robin. He, 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 he looked the way you saw him on the movies, you know. You know, I think I think you know you've arrived when a character on the Flintstones is named after you. He was Stony Curtis. Remember that plastic? Yeah, that's right. And what about and what about the other one that played in uh, with Elvis in the movie Viva Las Vegas? My favorite, Anne Margaret. She oh, was in the Flintstones her. too. I love Anne Margaret. I love it. I married my wife because she looks like Anne Margaret. Are you like Elvis? Do we? The two of you guys no. together? I remember it's a king. Oh, looks oh, oh. like Robert De Niro. Actually, if he took off his glasses, you'd see it. We've we've had a big discussion on the show about this. He's a cross between Robert De Niro and Al Lewis from the Munsters. Let's have a look. There it is. Oh yeah, that's it. That's it. That's the man. You met Bo Derek, didn't you, Leslie? I oh, know. I didn't meet Bo Derek. No. She was on a film set. With Ringo, did you go to that film? No, you got the wrong lady. Her Who was it? Raquel Walsh. Oh, sorry, sorry. You met 
Raquel was, did you? Wow. So, uh, before I was, uh, I went and did Ringo's hair for the Magic Christian. Yeah, that's so, it. So the cast, the cast was Raquel Welsh, who was like, oh, um, beautiful. Peter Sellers, uh, John Cleese from um, um, Forty Towers. Yeah, oh, no, yeah, Forty Towers. Yep. Yeah. Monty Python. Monty Python. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, brilliant. Um, and Ringo, uh, yeah, and Raquel Welsh, that was a lady to see. She looked also looked like she looked on the posters. I saw her in that outfit. It's leather. And she yeah. had a whip. She had a whip, yes, she certainly did. <laughs> and what happened? Did you know they had that, the ladies in the boat scene? What, on the film? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. No, I didn't. I was only there. <laughs> I didn't see the boat scene. You need to see some photos of what what happens in that scene. Oh yeah, I wasn't there. You know, you know, I got chucked off the, the okay. set. I, I Sorry, you were the best parts. Well, I, I nearly got chucked off the set because uh, why? Because there's such a thing called equity, which means you had to be part. It's basically part of the union. So I was doing Ringo's hair in his dressing room. I then watched him go on stage, you know, on the set. I saw that his hair wasn't quite right. So I went, the moment I went on stage there, they, they went cut. And the electricians and the uh, artists went, that's it. And I said, what's wrong? I said, are you a union member? I said, no, off or we call a strike. So I couldn't go on the set. I could watch, but I wasn't allowed to go on the set, which is quite amazing, actually. Uh, that's changed now, but that, that, that's what it used to be. Very similar to that if an artist wanted to go to America, um, they wouldn't do it, and vice versa. You know, they, 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 you have to have a special, like, um, uh, not the green card, but you, they used to think the thing, if an American can't do it, then, you know, well, then why bring an English person over to do it when an American do it? And vice versa, it was vice versa. Thank God those days have changed. So that was an interesting interesting setup yeah we went back into time yeah and and robin and i were there with you in the swing 60s let's say and you took us for a walk down carnaby street right when it was at its height like austin bowers time is it like the movie uh is it like the movie yeah it was but it wasn't i wouldn't take you a walk down there but um why it was all because it, it all got commercial it was all got very good. We had six months of when, you know, great American group, um, I think American, American, Australian, the Walker Brothers. You know, you never heard the most fantastic three guys there. You know, they would go down, uh, the Who would go down there uh, and buy their clothes in the shop there until it got commercial. And then everyone moved down to the King's Road or whatever. So, yeah, I would take you down there. You would fit the part because you look like it. You look like you would, you would blend in very easy there. Uh, Robin, 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 she'd look all right with those military jackets. Same hair. She would have, you know, she would have wore those white, uh, white uh, boots. Yeah, uh, military jacket. The white boots. Yeah. I, I would like that. Yeah. There that could be a whole new look for me. Maybe I should start wearing them now. No, I was trying to get plastic first into the white boots, and then we'll see. Maybe we'll all wear white boots next time we see you. Yeah, but Robin, what kind of jacket would you like? That's a great question. I don't know. What do you think would be good for me, plastic? You can get a military jacket, but let's ask Leslie. because you he just took the words out of my mouth. I would say shirt. a military jacket. Um, with uh, Courage, uh, yeah, dressed like Courage, the French designer, the Vidal haircut. Wow, you would be having a photograph taken all the time down the swing in London there. Yeah, plastic, you'd have to just look after her. <laughs> you know. It would be right. That's Can you imagine yourself down there and Austin Powers comes down as well? <laughs> he loves his Austin Powers. You love it. I love those movies. I just love them. Don't you love them too, Robert? I love them. Exactly. Fun. Very, we need fun. We are used Tell to me, What about the film Blow Up? You seen the film Blow Up with David? I've Hibbing? seen it. That's the one that's got all the groups in it. 
Well, there you go. It's fabulous. That, that, is, that was based on uh, David Bailey, the photographer, um, roughly. And uh, you talk about Austin Powers. Just watch that film blow up. It's fabulous. Absolutely fun. David Hemmings starts it. Leslie, did you... Leslie, did you get asked to go on any movies? Go on in the movies? Yeah, like those 60s movies, you know, when they had the groups on and they asked you, can you come because you look like a model and come and no, be in the film? Was most of the time a model, not a model. I used to go with the Bee Gees to uh, Top of the Pops. They used to record it and they used to mine. So it used to be on a Thursday night in, in England where they would mine. They would do the show on the Wednesday and then they would mime it on the Thursday, and I used to watch, used to do their hair and watch the girls in the audience and literally screaming, and um, but never, never was allowed to go on stage because that's not my job. That's what a job. scene, mate. You're in the scene. Oh, lovely. It's, it's, <laughs> it's so interesting, all of the screaming. I don't think I've ever been anywhere where I've screamed because I've you know seen someone. I don't know. I've never been in that situation. Maybe that was more of a you know '60s thing. I you, know, you see it on TV. Obviously, I was born in 1968, so I can't say from firsthand experience. But it who is interesting. The, to watch. Who was the people that you, uh, the bands or, or artists that you liked, Robin, when you grew up as a teenager? Oh, I, I definitely loved the Beatles for sure. Um, definitely, I, and I probably had a little crush on Paul McCartney for a while, just like everybody did. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I actually, it's interesting because as a child, I watched the monkeys, and then later in life, I ended up working for one of them. But, um, you know, uh, that was probably fun for me. But I definitely admired like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and. Uh, I think you missed the screaming era because um, I did because uh, this was uh, the, the, for instance you know I left school at fifteen like you couldn't do that today um, so you get people who are fifteen six year old girls fourteen twelve thirteen fourteen seeing really young people you know really young from the early days so maybe you know. I mean, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, these guys, you know, you get these girls and they're screaming because they've been let out. They didn't, they weren't, they weren't studying. I'm not saying, you know, they went to university. So a lot of people just left school and they saw their idols, you know, they were into the music and they, they started screaming. It's, um, well, you know, you just got to look at New York, Shea Stadium. That's why the people stopped um, um, touring because of that. Why were the girls screaming like mad and, you know, at the airports? They would scream really at uh, amazing, amazing scenes. It must have been something like I remember Peter Tork of the Monkeys talking, you know, I worked for him and, and he would talk about the screaming and the running away from the girls kind of thing. Although I don't know how much they necessarily wanted to run away from the girls at that time. But no. <laughs> late, even in 2011, I was in the UK for the Monkeys tour. We toured around England. Um, oh, was, okay. Was that with Mickey Dolans? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And Davy. Davy was alive then. Yes. Yeah. 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 Did he? Did you meet up with Paul McCartney? He, he, he was friendly with um, Paul, wasn't he, Mickey Dolans? I I yeah. don't believe that he reached out to him. No, not to my knowledge, anyway. Right. On that trip, I know I remember. Um, Peter telling me a story about, you know, being meeting the Beatles for the first time. And I think it was John Lennon. Correct me if I'm wrong, Plastic. You may have heard this before. I think it was John Lennon who called over to one of the monkeys. It may have even been Peter and said, hey, monkey man. Yeah, that's right. That was John. <laughs> Talk to Talk to him that way. So I kind of remember they were in a uh, in awe meeting the Beatles, you know, as the monkeys at that time, which, of course, I would probably be in awe as well if I met. Yeah, well, they would be they would they, they were being promoted as the American Beatles at one stage, weren't they? Um, but Warren Epstein helped when they came over to tour in England. He had something to do with it. But also the monkeys became friends with certain Beatles. Like, for example, Peter became a very good friend of George and played banjo on Wonderwall, his album or whatever it was. Yes, I, I remember that. 
Um, yeah. a television commercial too. There was a TV commercial. Pizza. Remember that plastic? Yeah. Yeah, with Ringo. Right. Pizza. Yeah. Was that? Was it? A, was it Doritos? What was that for? No, no, it was Pizza Hut. And Ringo's on the drum, and the three monkeys yeah. are there: Peter, Davy, and uh, Mickey. And the and the caption was something right person but wrong band or something. Yeah. <laughs> It was funny. I'll have to look that up later, but definitely interesting times. I know um, Plastic before, I know you're probably busy, Leslie, and we don't want to keep you too, too yeah, long. Okay. Plastic yeah. had a trivia question for you, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. I'm going to have you, I'm going to have you, uh, Leslie and Robin, on my trivia show if we can arrange a time. Not now, but if you're free too, Robin, you're okay. welcome. And I I'll just like, ask you a couple of like questions. Leslie. Leslie's a good person. I'm glad that we, Leslie was on the show today. Yeah, Leslie's a good that. person. And let me okay. tell you, I'll just ask you a couple of Beatle questions, right? Yeah. Just to see how you go. And if you know the answer, just say the answer. Okay. Paul yeah, McCartney yeah. played the bass, left or right-handed? Left. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, darn. I had a fifth shot and I didn't even try. Okay. Now, on Abbey Road, who crosses the crossing first? Which beetle? Uh, Lennon. That's right. <laughs> he knows. He knows them. I even have a picture. I didn't, I, I spent one day in that area and I never got to see any of the sites, but my daughter has, of course, the picture of herself as one of the beetles crossing the street. Okay, okay, I got it. I didn't get it. I'm zero for two. This is Doesn't good. matter. I'll go okay, one for one. I'll ask a question. Like, the, how many Beatles were there? You know. <laughs> right. So you got one. Perfect. <laughs> I like Leslie. See, he's trying to include me and make me feel good. Yes. Yeah, but I didn't answer on purpose. Come on, last question, Mr. Plastic. Where's the question? I'll give you, okay, um, here's a question. What name did Paul McCartney write a song for Peter and Gordon? I think it was called Woman. Yeah, that's right, but do you want to know what name he used? Bernard Webb. Correct. There you go. You are the trivia king. I also got another question, last one for you both. What album was recorded what album? last? Not released. What album was recorded last? Recorded last. Okay. Um, Abbey Road? That's right. Because the story is, Robin, that they recorded Let It Be but didn't release it. Then they did Abbey Road. Then they released Abbey Road. And then they released Let It Be. Anyway. As I, as I want to say, what a fantastic show we've had. I just Thank want to you. show you one more time, if I may. That's the book, The Cutting Edge by Leslie Carendish. And we also got a Spanish version. And the best place to get it from, can they get it direct from you, Leslie? Yes. To somebody just um, message me on Facebook or go on my website and, uh, and get it direct from me. And I'll do a signed copy to whoever. I want one. I'm going to order one. So count me in. We'll do. Well, what we do is we'll say goodbye to everybody out there and just stay there. So anything else you'd like to ask, Robin, before we go? I I really hope that you would join us again sometime because this has been a lot of fun, Leslie. I really thank you. Enjoy. You made it a lot of fun as well, both of you. So thank you. <laughs> All right, from everybody out there, it's goodbye from Plastic EP and Robin and Leslie. Bye. See you guys. Bye.